Welcome to the Dynamic Radiologist Podcast, where we feature leading experts in healthcare. And now here's your host, Dr. Stephen Brownstein. Hello, Dr. Stephen Brownstein here, and I am the host of the Dynamic Radiologist Podcast. Through this platform, I have the great honor to interview top leaders in health and in business to discuss what they're doing to change the world. Some of the amazing guests that I've interviewed include Dr. Jeffrey Cronk, CEO of Spinal Kinetics, Smart Injury Doctors, and Smart Injury Lawyers. Dr. Mike Carberry, CEO of Advanced Medical Integration. Dr. Donald DeFabio and Howard Reese, CEO of, Tele- of the Teledentist. This episode is brought to you by Dynamic Medical Imaging. I started this organization 16 years ago and it experienced consistent growth and opportunity ever since. We have the only Phonar upright MRI in central and northern New Jersey, and we've had patients consistently coming to our center from over 20 miles away. Over 25% of our patients are either claustrophobic or have failed to have their MRIs completed at, in a closed unit. They have come here to have their studies performed in the Phonar upright open MRI. We've had over 3,000 doctors from New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania refer their patients to us. What is really telling though that these same doctors who've referred to family and friends have come here to have their own imaging done. Please check out our testimonials uh, and interviews on our website at at www.dynamicmedicalimaging.com and see for yourself what your fellow patients have said about their great experience at Dynamic Medical Imaging. Our second sponsor today is Spinal Kinetics, uh, which I started over 10 years ago. We help medical providers of all specialties evaluate for the presence, location, and severity of spinal ligament injuries. If you do stress radiographs in any format, then you can send them to our trained doctors who use our special technology. Spinal Kinetics developed a technology called CRMA, or Computerized Radiographic Menstruation Analysis, which is an advanced x-ray measurement technology to accurately measure the exact abnormal motion problems that occur with a spinal ligament injury. If you have any questions, go to www.thespinalkinetics.com or email us at support at thespinalkinetics.com. Well, today I have the great honor to interview one of my close friends, doc, uh, doctor. Well, he, he, uh, to me, he's a doctor, Joseph Krieger. Uh, Joe is the president and founder of uh, Boston Biolife, a cutting edge educational organization, organization providing structured programs in life sciences technologies uh, for physicians, scientists, and healthcare providers interested in learning regenerative and functional medicine. Joe has a degree in biochemistry from Boston University School of, of Medicine, School of Medicine, and designs and creates course content with wor- world renowned physicians, scientists, and specialists with exemplary experiences and background in a variety of fields of medicine. Joe customizes and facilitates each course with the intended outcome of offering a better understanding of various emerging life science technologies to healthcare providers that are in a position and have an interest in making a positive impact in people's uh, lives. I can vouch I've gone to several of Joe's lectures and the course content is excellent and how it's run is, is the best I've ever seen. In fact, uh, Joe is going. Joe in Boston BioLife is going to be uh, doing all the educational format and running uh, for another uh, organization that I'm part of. So, Joe, why don't you tell your backstory of how you got to be where you are now, and you're now sitting with your wide open shirt and, and uh, also Try to button up here a little bit, I guess. No problem, but. Uh, <laughs> Well, thanks, Steve. First of all, let me thank you for having us. Can you hear me okay? I hear you fine. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate uh, the, the kind introduction and the friendship over the years. And, you know, you've been an innovator in the field of medicine, and I have been very fortunate just kind of, you know, amalgamating my backstory in a useful way that's concise is, that, you know, I've been fortunate to have gone from biochemistry and medical school right into medical devices. I was at one point an aspiring physician and my experience is A, in getting into medical school, which I didn't, I just walked in and knocked on the door and sat down. 
And then said, how much does it cost to go to medical school? And they just looked at me like I was crazy, but I stayed for six years. And um, I worked in a lab and I did tissue culture. And ironically, all the experiences I had as a young biologist, biochemist, are relevant to what I do today. Cytokines, growth factors, extracellular matrices, tissue culture. So I had a really, in all the interleukins we studied, and I think back then there was 12 collagens. I don't know. I think there's 23 or 28 now. Um, but the, the field of science was always evolving um, and is exciting to me as a student. And I felt that that's where I wanted to be in some type. Of, I wanted to be a doctor because when I was a kid, I told people I'd be a doctor and they'd leave me alone. Like, oh, he's going to be a doctor. So we don't have to bother him. You know, if I said I was going to be a musician or something, they would have tried to guide me into a more uh, you know safe path. But um, when I got into medical devices, literally everything I was involved in as a young product manager. And because I was a bio, biochemist, I spoke the language of both science and medicine and, and, and biology. And so I was able to communicate on a high level with physicians and scientists on very complicated clinical matters, things like epilepsy, things like um, stereotaxy for functional disorders, uh, Parkinson's, epilepsy, um, um, movement disorders of all kinds, including dementia. So everything we did at Radionics, which is where I started, was the, the future and the cutting edge of medicine. And we quickly realized that everything had to be facilitated by imaging. So the better the pictures you could see, the better the x-rays were. So going back to your $3 million stand-up MRI, you know, that is one of the gold standards in medical imaging, but the limitations are clearly cost and availability. Phonar, I actually talked to them 20 years ago. But how do we put this in more clinics so people can get a non, you know, a weight bearing MRI of their lumbar spine? So as we looked at interventional pain management 25 years ago, and we saw what the complexities were, most of them really came around diagnostic diagnosis because, as you know, pain subjective and what hurts one may not hurt another. And, you know, when you're in a, um, you know, a supine position on an MRI table, you're not loaded. So your imaging is falsely valuable, if you will. It's not invaluable, but it has some, you know, limitations to it. So as interventional pain management evolved, imaging studies like fluoroscopy and then endoscopy came along and minimally invasive discectomies, I was kind of always along for that ride. So whether it was surgical navigation or different energy modality, even things like stereotactic radio surgery in Linux for brain tumors, that was pretty much where I grew up. So I kind of grew up naively thinking, that if you can build something that solves a problem in medicine, you can get paid for it and then regulate it. You will see if it works first, right? And if anybody cares. So that's kind of, I went backwards where most organizations R and D something to death. We actually built it, put it into clinical practice, see if it worked. And I was fortunate. I worked with a bunch of genius MIT engineers and I was in charge of sales and marketing and education. And I started running courses in minimally invasive surgery, pain management, and I realized that I can create greater influence in new and emerging therapies through education, i.e. educate 10, educate 100, and they'll educate each other. And we really turned interventional pain management into the mainstream. It was a, wasn't even a subspecialty when we started. It was just a bunch of anesthesiologists, you know, doing some type of injections in the spine, using some type of modality, steroids or other. And then it kind of evolved with imaging first biplane x-ray and then fluoro. The urologist in the, cert in the OR brought the fluoro. And there may have been 800 people that knew how to use a C-arm or did any form of image guided injections in the US. Rick Derby and ISIS, Charlie April, those guys had just begun. And then I popped on the scene doing radio frequency training and sold radio frequency lesion generators for low back pain as described by Menno Schleider and some of the other uh, international leaders where anesthesiologists were clearly the leader. So really what we saw was a shift in personnel for orthopedic and neuro to anesthesia who had no right by rights, learning how to use a C-arm and treat a pain patient, except for the pain patient became part of their dominion. And even fast forward to where you are now, everything now is early detection, looking for nuances and diagnosis. So just closing the gap on my background, I was able to combine all those things, science, uh, education, um, running meetings, meeting planning, education, uh, training coordination into my latest iteration, which is Boston BioLife, which is now five years old, almost six. Uh, and we started running courses on interdiscal biologics, looking at stem cells and biologics, as opposed to regenerative medicine, which is a process versus the things that make it happen, which are cells, signals, and scaffolds, and really delving into 
bringing scientists together with healthcare providers and technology providers so that we can train physicians in the science of regenerative medicine so that they can treat their patients. Um, and so things like PRP and bone marrow aspirate and adipose drive biologics, all of these came from different parts of the industry. Fat came from cosmetics, bone marrow came from orthopedics, a set, uh, PRP kind of came from sports med, but also aesthetics with vampire facelifts, et cetera. So we've been really just an, an integrator, a coordinator, and a facilitator of educational content through this vehicle that we created, which is, you know, kind of a, an ADD, hands-on science festival where people try things and do things, and there's ultrasound machines and fluoro devices and centrifuges, and people can learn how to do they learn the basic science of regenerative medicine from PhDs and scientific experts in each modality. And then they get the hands-on experience in the actual clinical applications with healthcare providers and technology providers. And then hopefully they have enough awareness to know they need more training. They do more research. They study more papers and they learn more. Maybe the vendor comes to them or they go to a different meeting after ours. And we're just a step along the way. Uh, only 10 to 20% of the people that come to one of our events do something meaningful, but over 27 meetings, that's added up to a few thousand people that do this the right way or do it, you know, in a way that's scientifically at least somewhat validated. And we know there's enough negative press to go around, but at the end of the day, patients are looking for technologies and these technologies are readily available and they shouldn't be vilified. They should be studied and they should be understood for what they are. And we try to do that too by working with other organizations like Perinatal Stem Cell Society, World Stem Cell Summit, um, AAOM, IO Foundation, World Academy of Pain Management Ultrasonography. We're more than happy to help any organization fortify their mission and propel it forward by having access to resources that we have. We're helping them, we're promoting them because it takes a village and it takes a lot of time as this isn't easy, it's not obvious, and it's not very well understood or readily available. So with that, I'll suspend a little bit so you can get a word in edgewise. But that's kind of how we got here. But that took 25 years. But in the last five years, we've made the same progress that we did in the prior 20, just because of the speed of connectivity today and the, and the ability to communicate across large sp periods of space and time really has facilitated understanding and you know, again, I focus on the good and what's possible, not the bad and what's not. And, you know, even drugs and surgery, you say what you want about them. They got us from A to B. Prior to RF, there was nothing but drugs and surgery, spinal cord stimulators, drug delivery pumps, and every minimally invasive therapy modality, cryo RF. You know, there's a million of them that are being used across every specialty to help patients. Now it's time to look at the cellular level, the tissue regeneration. Like I think you mentioned the International Cellular Therapies Group, Dr. Harshfield's growing. Um, and how that organization wants to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together as well. So all of these things come together with a like-minded intent. And I think that that's really going to help move us forward in the best scientific way possible. And again, now I'll suspend. So you are the great connector. You've, you've managed to take the information from the lab, uh, have doctors educate, treating doctors how to use this technology and bring it to their patients. You also have integrated the commercial vendors on, on a positive way, how they can support the doctors that are using the, this translational medicine, this uh, whether it's regenerative or alternative medicine, whatever you want to call it, um, without the, the vendors involved to get the materials that they need um, it'd be a lot of you know, academic uh, exercise rather than uh, therapeutic exercise. So, you know, obviously, you know, you've spent the better part of your life being in a position where you are now, where you can, you know, co uh, curate, synthesize, and show the doctors how to apply this information to making people's lives better, because that's what it's all about. And I think you know, especially nowadays, everybody's talking about opioids and, and mm -hmm. uh, suicides with the veterans, uh, that the, the more treatment options people can have to make their lives more meaningful and, and full, um, it, it's great. And, uh, you know, 
like I said, I've been to several of your courses and they're the most professionally run I've come across. And I've gone to NYU, I've gone to all the other courses, but it, it's run like a fine tuned machine. Well, con content is king and the scientists bring the credibility and people ask me, so how do you know how to do this? I said, I don't know any other way to do it. If you can't validate something historically in research, and I grew up with a simple formulary for education, history, physics and theory, the clinical applications, the pathophysiology of those clinical applications, the modality itself, the step by step, and then complications and outcome and regulatory. And then if you want to throw in a business case, a business case. So if you look at PRP, you know, how long has PRP been around? What do we what do we know? What publications are there to support its evidence? And the one thing I would say about the industry, um, it's fragmented, right? And one of the things I'd like to say is you'd have to travel the world and it'd take you several years, even if you knew what you were looking for, to find everything that you'll find in one building. And albeit I put our meetings in wonderful places. I believe in cathartic venues. You know, I'm not a hotel snob, but there's something to be said for your time away or even keeping integrated with your family. If we want people to think, we want people to get away from their their day to day doldrums and to consider and to interact and be stimulated by someone else. You know, musicians perform better when they're with, with each other. People feed off each other's. We see athletes, you know, that aren't as good when they're put with athletes that are better. They perform and shine at a higher level because they're influenced and motivated by their environment and the people they work with. So there's definitely the collaborative environment, but really it's a question of no one listens to the biologists and they know, you know, why do we spend money on research? Why do we try to discover new drugs? What's the point of new therapies if it never reaches a patient? Well, part of that barrier to entry is not only grants and funding, technology transfers and academia and the government, all the wonderful things that get in the way. It's really that the doctor doesn't know about it. And unless you work in one of the medical schools that teach regenerative medicine, which I think there's eight, and they're not ology centric. So there's regenerative medicine, but it's not cardiology regenerative medicine, not orthopedic regenerative medicine. It's not urological, neurological or other. It's just regenerative medicine. Now they can reach out and they have Wake Forest, Duke University, University of Miami, University of Utah. They've all reached out and created projects like the parabiosis mice that you see that demonstrates things like exosomes and the blood of the young. So all these things are validated through science and research, but just not very well. And they're not accessible to people that are sole practitioners working, seeing 2000 patients a year with a large patient base with limited resources and tools. We wanna open up their eyes and say, maybe it's just nutrition. Maybe it's just exercise. Maybe it's something like PRP. But after we change the inflammatory condition of the patient, so functional medicine also coming to bear into this world. And, and that's really all we're trying to do. But doctors can't teach doctors as well as scientists can teach doctors because they're simply not equipped or given those assets in their day-to-day -day lives. PhD spent all day, every day. And I would argue their grant writing skills determine their fate. So they're very committed to what they do. And if you listen to them, there's a lot of answers there. So uh, obviously COVID has affected every business, mine included, as well as yours. You know, you made a business prior to COVID on on-site seminars. Um, how did you pivot uh, with uh, COVID? Well, it was interesting because as COVID was coming along, we had actually decided to take a break from on the road simply because when I looked out at my January date in 2019, 2020, there was probably five or six other meetings that were running. And I, it's not that I don't my meeting can't stand up against anybody else's, but my faculty are, are, are taxed. My vendors are taxed. If everybody has a meeting in January, I'll wait till March or April or May. So that was my decision. I need 60 days to get a meeting off the ground in a meaningful way. I have a strategy where I locate them. So even if I did it in Boston in May, that was fine. And then as we know, so I was supporting other people's meetings. I was looking at selling vendor resources, faculty, uh, attendee, Healthcare provider resources in the form of research papers, our academy publications, and our commercial webinars, which promote various vendors in a non-CME fashion, but they're highly scientific. We have over 60 to 80 free webinars on our website, bostonbiolife.com. Go to webinars and go to past webinars and just, you know, there's everything in there and it's really well done. And, you know, hats off to all the people that supported us. We have over 6,000 viewers every year 
come through our door to look at our educational content. And we're committed to creating more content because it really helps. So you can learn. So we had committed to started to do more online, but not the way we intended because I thought I would go back on the road. But as we were forced to not, I found that the platform we created and the thirst for information, certainly in light of COVID, where immune health became center stage, testing became center stage, looking at biomarkers or predispositions for patient types became center stage, uh, perhaps not as much as we'd like, but you know, all these other mandates had come along and we started looking at, you know, the concept of contagions and virology and personalized precision medicine, which really drove the functional side of nutrition and individual care plan pathways, which was always at the cornerstone of personalized precision health. So it really gave us a time and a platform to do more with less, to create more content than we ever did before because we weren't required to have a building or a location or a venue. We weren't traveling anyone around. There was a legitimate reason to stay home. Everybody was doing their part, but we seemed to have learned more than ever in that time period. And the messages were more important than ever. And we, I think we took a really positive step forward in helping the healthcare community understand the interrelationships. If you're a urologist, you need to now be a virologist. You need to under be functional medicine specialist because you need to know the health and wellness of those patients. Things like telemedicine, texting, patient um, engagement. How do patients become more mindful? How do we get them involved? You know, they, you just can't stick a, a regenerative medicine technology into somebody's knee if they're morbidly obese or have other comorbidities, diabetes is rampant. We know that food is, is poisoning our, 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 our patient population. We know we're unhealthy. And now we see the effects of it. 40% of COVID patients, and however they've been diagnosed, are diabetic. So who are the most vulnerable among, among us? But who are they? You know, what can they do? Because if they don't do something about it. So whether it's um, technologies like apps that help, Patients follow plans or companies that institute wellness programs using companies like Full Scripts that have dispensaries, people setting up clinics. I think the market, not just us, but the market has pivoted to be patient-centric healthcare and more, more nimble to react to the limitations. All right, we don't want to overwhelm our healthcare system. Great. I don't think hospitals are good places to go for some of this triage. I think the more isolated and diverse and sparse you can put patients across different geographies. Look, but the testing, the other thing we learned beyond our ability to, to communicate is look how quickly things were deployed. No matter what your political view is or your belief about a vaccine or a test, and I have my own opinions about the accuracy of PCR tests and IgG and IgM, and we made a living selling them. We promoted a couple companies selling them. Uh, we believe in you know knowing and I think testing, testing, testing is going to become never going to go away because we can test for lots of stuff, not just viruses. And if it's not this virus, what it might be some other. But do we know our antibody profile? Do we know how we stand immunologically in the face of disease and pathogens? That's a whole new world. And it's a world the patient can be responsible for. But look how quickly people got tested. Look how quickly information got out. Look how quickly things were adopted, like hand washing and masks and staying at home or whatever. Perhaps gladly so, when all the fast food restaurants, the liquor store and the marijuana stores are open and you're told to stay home and here's more money to do so, kind of tough to resist the edict. Um, and who knows if it mattered? We still had 600,000 deaths and millions of infections, which speaks to the, the elusiveness of the virus, uh, limitations in our ability to even protect ourselves without really protecting ourselves with immune health. So the indictment and the awareness in the spotlight clearly falls back on, fell back on patient-specific healthcare. You can't rely on a stranger who knows really nothing about you to give you advice on your most precious resource, your health. You need to. We're all smart enough to do accounting. We know we took calculus and algebra. People can figure this out. You can understand that nutrition and gut health and your immune health and things like mitochondria matter, sunlight, fresh air, and exercise. None of that was mandated. You know, forget about things like hydroxychloroquine, you know, and safety profiles of drugs that people never heard before that have been used forever, like metformin for cancer. You know, our history is riddled with off-label utilization of medications that have long-lasting and, you know, high safety profiles. We're not here to speak about that. What about diet, exercise, and nutrition? What about eating well? 
And what about our environment? That's what's really as more important than any of the other stuff, in my opinion. You know, there's, there's a lot of examples of medicine that came out for one use, Rogaine, Metformin. Uh, you know, You're missing the big one. You're missing the big one. Viagra. Viagra. Well, my age, I, that's not a big one. <laughs> it's a big one to a lot of people. ED is huge. That's true. And now we're staring down the barrel. And here's the other side cool thing about it. a lot of these inflammatory diseases have other manifestations like ED and obesity and hair loss. So, you know, show me a 45 year old morbidly obese person with ED, no hair. And, uh, you know, we're going to show you somebody with poor gut health. We're going to show you somebody who's got uh, hormone imbalances. They're hormone deficient. Uh, they probably have low oxygen, things like their glycocalyx, things like their plasmalogen levels, things like their nitric oxide, all stuff that can be tested for by them at home. And that can be influenced through education, through primary care, well, maybe not naturopathic, family medicine, but every ology, every specialty has an ability to expand their practice now because a healthier patient makes it for a better outcome, whether it's a knee or a stent or whatever it is. You're only going to get better if you get healthier, physically, you know, physically healthier, not just fix the knee, fix the thing, fix, you know, stop the aging process, stop the inflammatory process. And whether you use a $3 million ultrasound machine or, you know, a handheld, you know, I'm sorry, MRI or a handheld ultrasound, the size of a cell phone, all of that doesn't matter if the patient isn't moving in a direction on their own behalf, lifestyle, behavior, um, et cetera, to become healthier. And that's really where I think this whole thing needs to go. So I know one of the things that you pivoted is giving uh, uh, many seminars. You know, on, many courses. Uh, many courses. And the, the last one you did was the microvascular health that uh, Hans Vick and Dr. Harshfield, Dave, uh, participated in. Um, and Dr. Lewis, too. Dr. Lewis was incredible. He was brought to us by Harshfield. And here's the, you know, just as a quick aside, Boston Biolife is so fortunate because everybody brings their, their ringer. Hey, I know a guy, right? We've been built off of I know a guy. And in many cases, these guys are ninjas and they know stuff and no one ever pays attention to them. Dr. Lewis enlightened us about ophthalmological, neurological uh, diagnosis using fundus cameras and optical coherence tomography. And talk about a kid in a candy store. That is huge because you can see Alzheimer's 30 years early. Why don't we know about this? Everybody's in their, I wouldn't say ivory tower, but in their own silo. Yeah. And, uh, you know, unless you actually look down the silo, you don't know that they're there. And unless they look out from the silo, they don't know other people are there. But, no, Dr. Lewis, you know, he, he's a genius as, as well as Dave. And, and Hans, I, I think it, it was an excellent uh, mini uh, seminar, a mini course, and uh, hopefully a lot of people attended it. Uh, but, you know, it, it's... It, yeah, we had close to 200 attendees, but really the, little, the small companies don't have it. It's not easy for a small company to get a lot of exposure. And so it's a leveraged thing. I mean, it's CME worthy, but it's not CME because I want to help these companies get exposure. So people like Glycocheck, you know, uh, Vascular Solutions, and the work that Bob Long and, and Hans Vink are doing, it not only validates principles of, of, of microvascular health and gas exchange and so the fundamentals that support things like nitric oxide, Berkeley New Life, and uh, Beth Shirley did a great job talking about, you know, what is the role of nitric oxide, speaking of Viagra, and how would do the, how important is, it? think about it, without every cell, like we say in regenerative medicine, the commonality of all tissue is vasculature and parasites live on the blood vessels, right? And when something happens, they run down and fix it. They're like little starfish. We've all seen the video that David Harrell made that's been passed around every meeting that shows the little zebrafish model or the, the infarct in the stem cell running down to the wound. We've seen, you know, the marching ants of radio labeled cells that are done IV for stroke patients. We we know that the science uh, in the basics of it work, but having access and providing resources to the companies to actually do something about it. Because otherwise they're looking to sit at a nutraceutical fair or an A4M and no offense to A4M, they really you know got the ball rolling and for 25 years they've kept the ship going, but it's time to validate 
the science behind this. Why does this work? We didn't have the tools they we have now. There's no excuse now to not know, you know, not to be able to look inside a blood vessel like Hans does. Not only the vessel itself, but the interluminal area, especially. That's what plaques form. You know, if it was 80% of cardiac events or first and last events, that means, you know, something's released and it's over. It's not like, oh, it hurts and I can have a stent. It's actually too late. You know, the, 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 whatever was indwelling in the lumen, because you can see that with IV ultrasound, right? Inter and, and all these tools. And he talks about that, Dr. Harshfield, about how he used to do that work. Yeah, it was funny. Probably about eight months ago, Dave called me up, Dr. Harshfield. He says, you know anything about the glycocalyx? I said, not the foggiest. So I, I never looked, did either. I looked it up. Next day, I called uh, uh, Microvascular Health. I talked to Gary, the head of marketing. And then yeah. the following day, uh, I was on the phone with Bob uh, Long. And the following day, Dave was on the phone with Bob Long. And the long story short, I had COVID in November. I was released with a PO2 of 94. I went on endocalyx as soon as yep. I got home because they wouldn't let me take it in the hospital. And my PO2 has been steady at 98. So I really believe that the endocalyx, which, which helped replenish my glycocalyx, which the uh, COVID virus attacked, uh, which they've had studies and uh, they've proved that, you know, the more severely uh, ill you are, the greater your microvascular health has Absolutely. been uh, compromised. So uh, I'm indebted to Bob and Hans with their research because I, I think it certainly helped me not have long haul syndrome uh, symptoms mm -hmm. and uh, feeling well. What's, inter what's interesting about what you just said is if you learn, you know, I'm I'm a dot connector, and you know, you might even say I'm kind of like a rain man where I start to see things. It's like, all right, so you just discussed your own clinical issue what was the fun one of the fundamental problems was your po2 you monitored yourself you found something and i in your now you've improved that through technology the technology is you know now promoting a service which can go into a clinic to test everybody's vascular score if you will at one of our meetings everybody had a little number on their badge and that was their vascular score i think 10 is good five's okay most people are on a three or, you know, getting up to an eight, but you can change it, right? So personalized precision healthcare and having the ability. So Top Doctor Rx, one of our clients, they have these tools that you can monitor your vascular health at home. So we have now, again, this is why I keep harping on the patient and maybe the doctor should tell them this, but like if I'm worried about Corona, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to worry about my immune health. I'm going to look at my vascular score. If I can find some simple way to hook up to a phone or something to measure my, if you have a reason to, you're in an older age group, you're in a pre, you know, you're in a predisposed, you know, uh, vulnerability population, whatever it is. But I think you're starting to see that now, see that now everything's possible. You have an external threat. You got a victim potentially in the patient. You've got ways to face, to know your know your vulnerability, to affect it, to monitor it, to change it, and to to, to you know to move in a in a longitudinal way to be able to not only be healthier for this or anything else that you encounter, and, and not to be too idyllic, but I mean th these pieces of the puzzle exist, and I think it's just the way healthcare is going. It's going more mainstream, FDA notwithstanding, and they should be testing the safety and efficacy of whatever. But at the end of the day, we know fresh air, sunshine, and food and water were all we ever were intended to have because that's all there ever was. Epigenetically, we're, we're a, a stew of waves and chemicals, and we don't know how this influences. Look at all the things that are happening with our, our youth without being too controversial. There's definitely a difference in, in the kids today. And I don't blame them. I think that people are morbidly obese because of genetic susceptibility to super pr processed foods. Not everybody, but there's no way a 13-year-old girl who's 280 pounds eats 10 times more than I do. It's just not possible. You know, these people would have to be eating five and six or seven chickens a day. You ever see my 600-pound life? Who feeds those people? It's a genetic predisposition to the, pro to the chemicals that are being introduced to our diet. And I don't know anything about this. Except when I look around, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I heard a few things at a lecture once what did make sense to me. We all have a genomic score towards a thing, whether it's ApoE for Alzheimer's or God knows whatever's causing diabetes, 
but it's it's because of the reaction to the overwhelming epigenetic variants that are in our environment now, whether they're buildings or lights or energy or cell phone waves or chemistry. It's definitely, you know, we'll evolve to change. And I think we've seen that already in the 50, 60, 70 years. I mean, what's autism all about? Where's that coming from? What other neurological disorders are coming along because of this? Some good, some bad. Um, we're definitely evolving faster than we ever had. But I think people also have the educational awareness and the tools to be able to affect their own health with their health care provider. So we want to help health care providers have access to the tools and have their patients actually. That's what full scripts got 10, 100,000. Uh, they have, I think, 100,000 health care providers, millions of patients all looking for something that can help with Crohn's, with toe fungus, with alopecia, with dermatitis, with whatever. It doesn't have to be catastrophic. It's just the beginning of something that's demonstrating mitochondrial dys dysfunction. So with, without knowing what's going to happen with COVID, I know you have a, a conference coming up mm. in San Diego. You want to tell, tell, tell me about it, tell the audience about it? So over the years, we've evolved from kind of a regenerative medicine for orthopedics, MSK, got into functional medicine, which led us into gut health and, you know, neuroscience uh, and things like traumatic brain injury have always been part of what my interests are. That's kind of why I started this, because I was interested in the brain and the neurochemistry of the brain and why we go crazy and why things happen to us as we age. And um, I like to say we all have a user's manual, right? We're all clients, we're all customers. Everything that can happen in science happens to us. And so there's a natural curiosity there. But as these biologics or therapies or concepts came, I started evolving the course into more functional, got into neurological, got into hair, sexual wellness and aesthetics, because honestly, that's what people pay to learn. That's what that really pays the bills. People want to grow their hair back. They want to feel better. And they, they're very concerned about their looks. All of those are still driving the underlying pathology of inflammatory disease. So we've combined all these wonderful things um, into a, now a three-day conference. The first day is functional medicine that talks about things like peptides and hormones, basic science of biology, regenerative medicine and functional medicine, things like personalized testing, gut health, um, sexual wellness, hair restoration, cosmetics and aesthetics. Um, variations in different treatment strategies, supplements. And then the next two days are the regenerative medicine. So bone, blood, adipose, dry biologics, extracellular matrices and proteins from serum, as well as what's the update on exosomes and perinatal. Um, they're all going through regulatory scrutiny now. And I still think there's enough to work with in the autologous family and the supporting therapy. So regenerative medicine is not going to work if you're unhealthy. So why not understand peptides and hormones and gut health and prior to, to, to being able to treat patients anyway. So we have all these other, you know, functional therapies that can be helped put to, put to good use. And then the second day, the last day is all about orthobiologics and, you know, physical therapy, outcome studies, publications and research, how many papers have been, Patients have been treated with bone marrow aspirate. What are the outcomes for this? What do we know about, you know, things like PRP and derivatives like leukocyte rich PRP and bone marrow aspirate, concentrated, non concentrated? What's the latest on fat and micro fat and nano fat uh, and SVT? We know SVF is a hot topic. Um, and wh wh what other things are done, like bracing and physical therapy and exercise? And again, nutrition, health, wellness, and testing in places like the Andrews Institute or major academic institutions like UCLA. And, and what have these people discovered? So all of that hopefully bridges the gap between the patient and the most innovative th you know, therapies available. And then we have nine separate individual breakouts of which the attendee attends six, three Saturday, three Sunday. So we have the aesthetic sex and hair are three, bone marrow fat and, and blood, PRP and other are three, and then orthopedic, orthobiologics and spine. So ultrasound imaging, joint injections and spine and fluoro and bone marrow harvesting are three. So those, that's your program. We've got world-renowned faculty heavily uh, influenced on the PhD side. 
And as we look at the biochemistry of inflammatory diseases, its clinical applications, and then the therapeutic approaches, everything's rooted in research and science. All the publications are, are there to be had. We have our peer-reviewed research access tool, pub, med publications research, med pub research on, on, on Facebook. Um, we have 2,000 followers on that. We've got 40,000 on LinkedIn and social media. And we are a community. We're a like-minded community. We've got 30 technology providers that'll be there to support you. All like-minded scientists, tech, you know, geniuses that have all, most people that have created an impact in this field have had a personal experience with it. That's the universal theme that I see. Someone has been affected by it. You know, they were struck by lightning and got out of a wheelchair. They were told they would never walk again. You know, and you could say whatever you want, but the numbers are pretty um, impressive when you look at the credibility of the people that are making these statements. Personal, in personal uh, stories have influenced discovery. It's not as if someone said, I'm going to make a million dollars doing this. In most cases, people go broke trying. Or if they ever knew what it would cost to go to phase two to phase three, they never would have discovered a protein in the blood that potentially can stop arthritis, right? They're everywhere. And these are the people that come to Boston BioLife. So it's, uh, it's a bit of an ADHD festival. It's the world's greatest science fair. It's probably the greatest co co you know, collaboration of scientists and technology providers and physicians that are, exist in the world. And, and everybody is truly there to help everyone else. And that's what's really the chemistry. Chemistry and tension, right? Why are we doing this? And do we all get along? And if you put your intention at, at the focus of the patient, if you're patient-centered in your intent, because remember, we're all patients, we all have loved ones, we all have people we know, can we predict, prepare, and prevent diseases? Can we de detect, deter, and defeat diseases? How do we get out front? And how do we all lead the charge? That's all Boston BioLife is. People have said it's the, the Sundance, Sundance Medical Festival, Music Festival of, of Translational Medicine. That's an honor because that's all I ever wanted it to be. It's not about me. It's not even about our company. It's about what we do. And it's about people like you that are out there pushing the front line with looking at, you know, spinal kinetics and diagnosing whiplash and other spinal injuries. People can talk about personal injury as being a bad thing. Well, it is, unless you're the patient, unless you're the one that's told there's no diagnostic reality for your disease and it's in your head or you're faking or you're malingering or you're on drugs or you have surgery unnecessarily, and you never get a chance to try to do something different. And that's all we're trying to say. How do we bring the innovation to the front line so that the patients and the physicians make their own discoveries about what's best for them, not to impose anything other than the ability or the will and the way, if so desired. I would put it like that. Uh, I, I think you've, you've done a great job, and I think it's only the beginning of, of your great connectedness to bring, connect the dots, bring various professions together under one, you know, either virtual or real roof. And uh, it, it's an honor to call you a friend. Um, well, I appreciate that, Steve. You know, yes. you're, you're, Likewise. You're a mensch. You know, you're, you know, I call you ace because you ace everything that you do. Uh, well, you know what it is, though, if you, like I tell you every day, if you, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I get the greatest job in the world because all my friends are geniuses and, and we're all hum we're all human. We're all humble. And, you know, I felt the Freitas, who is a big proponent of telomere health. And I, I do attract uh, people that are on the front line of everything. And she stood up to give her a lecture system. Can, so, can we please help this poor man? How do we help him do what he's trying to do? Everybody should be trying to help. Boston BioLife, because we're trying to help everyone else. And it's that spirit. It's that love, if you will. And she's a very beautiful soul. And she she posted on Facebook, you know, what a beautiful group of people and loving, kind scientists. And really, it's about helping people and helping patients. But it's also about, you know, having a good time along the way, figuring out if we're right. You know, the ideas are everywhere. No one listens. And all we did was throw everybody in a room. So they figure it out. And you see the light bulbs going off like crazy. And that's the value of the hands-on because you've got healthcare providers with problems. And when they roll their car into the shop and the mechanic sees the ball joints are broken and he says, you know, you can fix this and this, but if you did this, it would never happen. Then the light bulb goes off. I got 50 more just like it. And they go home and make a difference. And maybe they're in Spokane, Washington or Squirrel's Ankle, Kansas, who knows? But they're out there. 
and they're in community hospital and rural settings, and there's millions of people without access, and we're bringing that access, at least through awareness, through healthcare providers, for nominal consideration to our meetings. And we're trying to help the companies and the leading edge scientists. And we know there's crazy people that do weird things. And, you know, we believe that the right ideas and the right messages will come to the fore if the right things are done for the right reasons. And that's what we can count on. Goodwill comes from good intent. And you got to try. Divine spirit of action dictates doing something every day, whether you know what you're doing or not, to try to move something forward. Something's better than nothing. And, you know, with the, I just did a presentation yesterday or Saturday to um, the students of the early scientific students of Pakistan. And look what that part of the world's going through. And what a beautiful group of part people. You know, we talked about regenerative medicine, centrifuges, and how to draw blood, and how to how do they harvest fat, and what can it be used for, and how does it help? And they all wrote me a letter saying how wonderful it was to hear. So there's no barriers to ethnicity or geography. There's no religious, you know, limitations to mankind helping mankind. And without being, you know, too altru altruistic or corny, there really is mankind is good, and the, the willingness and the desire to help each other. It's just how do we do it? And if we can share those ideas across platforms and by, through various modalities, then that's really a gift. And it's a gift that we get to do it. Not just me, but all of us, including you. And you're, you're, you're the one that started this podcast. I didn't ask for this. But, you know, it's going to change somebody's idea on something. And it's going to help all of us, I think, move the ball forward. Oh, absolutely. So um, we've covered a lot. Um, and you know, you, you're, you're truly a, a great friend and a great asset to all of us in, in medicine um, to uh, bring all these different tribes together mm -hmm. under one roof. It's kind of uh, when the Indians, all the tribes got together for the council. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're the modern day uh, chief of all chiefs. And, wow. you know, it, 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 it's, it's great to, to know you as a friend, but also to be an observer of what you're actually doing and, and to know that, you know, you're such a great human being that, that uh, again, uh, words really can't describe how I, how I feel toward you as a human being. Well, thank you so much. You know, it's funny because Don Siopi, one of your colleagues, we've known each other since I was a kid running around New Jersey selling RF generators. I think I told, you know, I helped sell a table in the CRM. We set up this clinic. We worked together. And here we are all these years later. You know, we're all older. But, you know, we've all seen that potential, you know. And I think when you have played the course before, you know, you know there's a pond around that corner. So you don't hit a two iron. You hit a seven iron and a nine iron, right? So strategy is king. But really learning from others and, and seeing what others have done. That's what we have as an advantage. And, you know, I, I'm truly blessed and grateful for having the opportunity that I have. And, you know, I... Like I said, I, I feel like I don't work at all. I just every day goes flying by and then a million things happen. And the next thing you know, we're in, in San Diego. And we just did Dallas, which was huge. And we brought 100 people together. And, you know, there's other people having meetings. I support other people's meetings. I think everybody should go to as many different things as they can and sample because there's a lot of doctors that can make a lot of difference. And, uh, you know, so thank you for giving me this platform. And, you know, welcome to my, my, my living room. <laughs> and I see your 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 binders and your little banner there. And uh, you know, Steve, we're all we're all two guys in a pickup truck trying to make a difference. But the odd thing is we can make a difference. No, it's it's interesting. Most of the binders I'm taking <laughs> uh, Jay Abraham's uh Beyond Exponential uh course. And wow. the is the distinctions is funnel vision instead of tunnel vision. And what you, what we went over today is a perfect example of funnel vision where things from outside where you wouldn't think stuff would come from solutions, you know, your problem is the solution to someone else's bigger problem. Hmm. So remember your prayers, someone else's prayers are why you do what you do. Someone's, you know, needs the things that you're doing and whether it's educating a doctor who can help a patient or helping people find their way, you know, it's, it's, it's all important yeah. to be able to help it where you can and, I just think it's fascinating what's possible. I really do. Not to get crazy, but there are some amazing things happening. Like I told the Indian kids, 
you know, you can grow up an or, or you can have a, an organ transplant. You can grow one in a 3D. You can grow one in a petri dish. You can grow one in an animal. You can repair the one you have with tissue engineering. Uh, you can 3D print one. You can decellularize and eight recellularize a donor scaffold. All these things, and who knows what will happen in the future? You'll just re-engineer the gene using CART CRISPR Cas9 and all these other tech. I saw a thing the other day that was mind-boggling. You know, what CART T is right. It's training the immune system to attack whatever host you tell it to. Um, and there's a bedside CAR T device now. So somebody's dying of cancer and you're able to bring a machine the size of a, I don't know, it's like a defibrillator really, it's not that big, small suitcase. And it's somehow bringing your blood in one thing and pushing it through another and there's some chemistry going on. There's some exchange happening in there where antibodies are being either stimulated or created or whatever and the blood goes right back into the patient i mean just think about that crazy the lab is truly in your pocket you know one of the stories i tell and i know we got a roll but when i was a kid i was in medical school running these polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis things and i was purifying a bacteria out of gonorrhea or salmonella that had the ability to interact with human interleukin one so human interleukin one is the first phase of the acute phase response so every inflammatory insult or injury sets off by IL-1. It's the first one there. So I studied IL-1. And why were these bacteria expressing proteins that would ultimately trigger their demise? But I had to go through the bowels of the BU medical, through the past the morgue, into infectious disease to, to Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory to get a little vial. And then I'd trudge my way back through the cities, of, underneath the city of Boston, literally. And I would go to my lab. Now I have to, you know, take this lyophilized product and I have to resuspend it and separate it into phases and do this and this. And eventually I make a sample and then I have to make a gel and then I have to bake the buffers. And then I set up this contraption and I put the, I dye the, I dye my samples and I dilute them accordingly. I run a standard all day long. That thing runs. And at night I got to take it and put it in a, in a, you know, a cassette with a film and I stick it in a freezer and I, I wait all night. And then I thaws out the whole next day. And then I can put it, go in the dark room and develop. And I say, I got a band or I don't. I took a week for me to discover if my preparation would be good, my sample was good, my antibody was good, all of that. Because what it showed was there's a evolution of biological processes. This is everything I've ever done, plants, bugs, insects to humans. What is the conserved biological mechanism of cellular biology? And it was kind of a cool thing to study because why would you do it another way? A wheel's a wheel, right? And so, now you can do that in out probably three hours. You buy a little gel, it's all done. Your sample's all done. Your antibody's mint. You push a button, <laughs> takes a picture, sends it across the world via the internet. Students everywhere re re reviewing your results. Uh, it's just incredible the speed at which now science has moved forward. And now you can put it in your back pocket. You can put it in a van. You can put it in a lab. You can put it in a foreign country in a tent. So now we literally have the ability to have hands-on laboratory sciences. And just like the printing press went to a desktop printer and the computer went to your phone. Don't be naive to assume that your medicine's not doing something similar. It just is. Testing, monitoring, real-time evaluation, the ability to manage. You know, can we grow past? I heard 120s all this week and live because of other things. Now people are saying 150. So whether we want to have multiple careers, but we got to stay healthy. No matter how long we live. And that's what Dr. Lewis talks about. How how many healthy years do you have till you die versus when do you die? So if you live to your 80s, you probably had a higher degree of healthy life years than you do if you die when you're 60 or 70. Well, Joe, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to the Dynamic Radiologist Podcast. Make sure to click subscribe to get updates on our latest episodes. Oh,